Hello, welcome. Uh, Gail Bowen is an author, playwright, and teacher. Among her numerous writing awards are a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Crime Writers of Canada and the Distinguished Canadian Award from the University of Regina. Reader's Digest has called her Canada's best mystery novelist, and in 2018, she was awarded the Saskatchewan Order of Merit and the Grand Master Award of Crime Writers of Canada. Her latest novel, An Image in the Lake, is the 20th in her Joanne Kilborn series. Welcome, Gail. Thank you very much. I'm really glad, I'm very glad to be here. Originally, as some of you will know, this was supposed to have taken place, um, an interview with Marburg University this morning and uh, with uh, Professor Martin Kirster. Sadly, uh, the technology didn't work and I hope none of you were left out in the cold for too long, but at any rate, thanks to uh, thanks to Alex that we're we're all uh, we are back together again. So that's that's uh, really good. I would like to to uh, say hello to Martin Kirster, who I know was going to be sharing this link, and um, and I and he's and it was so much fun working with him and just talking about uh, crime fiction and throughout the world and and also to Marburg University for hosting us and also to ECW for hosting us. And finally, thank you all who are joining us now. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to, uh, it's just a pleasure to be with, uh, with you and talking about this. So, okay. Now I'm going to read from um, an image in the lake. There I, there I have learned how to do this. I think it comes up backwards, but whatever. Anyway, and um, the passage I'm going to read comes very close to the beginning. It's, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it takes place at an old fashioned prairie picnic. And I've been to dozens of these and, uh, and they're always a lot of fun. They're, uh, it's, it's really a kind of like going back to a more innocent time, I think. And, and uh, it's, there's, um, uh, oh, there, there's uh, chi uh, chickens being barbecued and uh, uh, softball games and, and uh, running, running races for, uh, for kids and, and uh, count the number of jelly beans in the fishbowl and, and, you know, a homemade lemonade and homemade pie by the piece and just all the kinds of things that I think were just were so are still very pleasant and uh, this particular prairie picnic, though, does have a purpose. Um, it's it's really to introduce Alison Janvier, uh, the young woman who has uh, it, it has become the leader of the party very recently. The contest for leadership was very hard fought, and in part, this prairie picnic is intended to uh, to uh, soothe the feathers of those who supported another candidate or uh, uh, or for the other candidates themselves. So anyway, here we are, and here's Joanne. So uh, Joanne and Zach, they are just, um, they, they're just arriving and, they, and they're decided they're going to go and have some of the barbecued chicken. We just started toward the picnic table set out for the chicken man's customers when Mark and Lori Evanson approached us. Mark was pushing a baby in a stroller. The encounter was, as New York Yankees catcher Yogi Berra famously remarked, deja vu all over again. One of the last times I'd met the Evansons, Mark had been pushing the stroller. He had been 19 then, a solid, good-looking young man with a solid, good-looking three-year-old son squirming to get free of the stroller. The baby's mother, Lori, had been at Mark's side at 19, she had the beauty of a teen magazine cover girl, shoulder length, dark blonde hair, peaches and cream complexion, blue green eyes, pert nose, and perfect rosebud lips. It was 16 years since I'd seen the Evansons. They were now 35, and yet they seemed not to have aged at all. When Lori recognized me, she clapped her hands together in delight. Her voice was sweet and lilting. Oh, Mrs. Kilborn, this is the best surprise. I've hoped and hoped that we would see you one day. And now here you are. She looked at Zach with frank curiosity and your, her brow furrowed in concentration as she worked through the possibilities of Zach's relationship with me. Then as suddenly as they had appeared, the furrows vanished. The problem was solved. 
why you must be Mrs. Kilbourne's friend, Laurie said, and her tone was triumphant. Zach's correction was gentle. I'm Joanne's husband, Zach Shreve, he said. Mark extended his hand to Zach. Well, congratulations, Mr. Shreve. Mrs. Kilbourne has always been a very good friend to us. I hope we can all be good friends now, Zach said. I crouched in front of the baby in the stroller and looked up at Laurie. Is this little guy yours? A shadow crossed Laurie's face. No, Clay is our only child. She brightened, but Andy is family. Andy is my dad's and stepmom's baby, Mark said. They have three children together. Gabriella is 16, Craig Jr. is 14, and Andy is 22 months. The name evoked memories of another Andy, one who had been dear to me and to many in our party. Is he named after Andy Boychuk? Mark nodded, he is. My dad said Andy Boychuk was a decent man. He was, I said, and he would have been very proud to have this handsome boy as his namesake. This Andy was a surprise, Laurie whispered. I stood. My youngest was a surprise too, I whispered, but a nice one. The sun was full on Laurie's face, but even in that unsparing light, she had the dewy freshness of a girl. As they had been 16 years earlier, Laurie's wide, innocent eyes were carefully made up. Peach eyeshadow blended into mauve and then a soft smudge of gray eyeliner beneath her lower lashes. Clearly she had found the look that worked for her and stuck with it. I'm so glad we ran into you today. I said, you both look great. Life is obviously treating you well. It is, Laurie said. Her voice was as musical as a wind chime. We don't live in Wolf River anymore. We live in Lumsden. It's 33 kilometers from Regina. When Lori didn't elaborate, Mark provided the context. Seven years ago, my stepmother, Amanda, inherited her father's house in Lumsden. It's a big, beautiful house. Amanda and my dad said the house was big enough for all of us and it would be good for everybody if we moved in. So we had a family meeting and we moved in. And it's work for your family and Craig and Amanda's, I said. Lori cast her husband an anxious glance. Obviously there was a piece of information that was Mark's to deliver. His gaze was steady. Mrs. Kilborn, I believe God moves in mysterious ways and that sometimes we see through a glass darkly. A prairie picnic seemed an unlikely setting for an existential discussion. A group of boys to our left was having a contest to discover, determine who could spit a watermelon seed the farthest. A woman next to them was selling chances on a stark quilt glowing with the colors of sunset. Next to her, children not much older than Andy Evanson were crawling and climbing through an obstacle course. Andy had spotted them and was struggling to get free of his stroller. Laurie reached down, released him and murmured, hang on buddy, that's where we're going next. When he was certain Laurie's assurance satisfied Andy, Mark began what was clearly a narrative he had delivered often. Wolf River Bible College grade school is a wonderful God-centered community of people who share the same beliefs, he said. It had been the right place for Lori and me, but it was never the right place for Clay. Our son had questions that Lori and I couldn't answer. Clay never fit in and he didn't believe what the teachers tried to teach him. He started asking questions and when the other students told him the teachers were right and he was bearing false witness, Clay started acting out. Lori and I tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. Clay said he was smart enough to find his own answers. Lori nodded emphatically. And Mr. and Mrs. Shreve, Clay is smart. He's like Mark's mother, very smart. We bought him a copy of the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures so he could find his own answers. We paid extra to have his name, Clay Thomas Evanson embossed on the leather cover in gold. 
that book of the Holy Scriptures was beautiful, but Clay wouldn't even open it. Laurie's lovely blue eyes, blue-green eyes filled with tears. Mrs. Kilborn, do you remember me telling you that we chose Clay's name from Isaiah 64, 8? But now, O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are the work of your hand. Mark and I tried. We did our very best. So did Clay's teachers. So did everyone else in the community, community. But no matter how hard we tried, Clay would not be shaped. Mark swallowed hard. Finally, the principal of the school called Lori and me in and said that it would be better for everyone if we found another school for Clay. The story seemed to be moving inexorably toward tragedy. Zach's eyes were downcast and my chest was growing tight. Lori picked up on our concerns. Don't be worried, she said. God had a plan. Mark picked up the narrative. Mrs. Kilborn, do you remember my mother, Julie? I do indeed, I said. Julie Evanson had been a thorn in the side of everyone who knew her. I heard she remarried, I said. She did, and the man she married is an important person with important friends who all have cottages up north at Emma Lake. My mother really loves Clay, and so does her husband. Clay was never happy in Wolf River, especially not in the summer. He didn't have friends, and there was nothing for him to do. When Clay was seven, my mother and her husband started taking him to their cottage for the summer. He was happy with them. And when we told my mother and her husband about Clay's problems at school, they said they were planning to move back to Regina and he could live with them and finish school there. So that's what he did. Clay just finished his second year at the School of Journalism, Laurie said. We're very proud of him. He has a job at Media Nation, and he might be here today. Mark and I are really hoping we'll see him. Mark put his arm around Laurie's shoulders. I think my dad knew Laurie and I would be lonely without Clay, so that's why he suggested we move in with their family. My mother's husband got me a really good job, and Manda and Laurie opened up a preschool together in our house. It's called Just Beginning, Laurie said and her eyes were shining again. I love the name because it's kind of the way it's been for Mark and me and Clay and everybody. We're all just beginning. Mark's gaze at Lori was adoring. That's exactly right, he said. We are all just beginning. Lori handed Andy to her husband and came over to Zach and me. I'm just going to hug you both, she said. Lori's arms were warm her smell, and her hair smelled of sunshine and summer and her voice was gentle. God bless, she said. Now, the second part of, the part of this also takes place at the prairie picnic and it's at the end of the day, at the end of the, the picnic part of it. And th this is typically um, a typical also, there's a truck bed is brought in, has been brought in, and there's entertainment. And then if it's a political uh, place, then there is a speech by whomever is uh, being honored or <laughs> whatever. Anyway, so now the sing-along was over and people were clapping and calling Allie's name in a ragged chorus. Allie, Allie, Allie. The event had been a triumph, but an old political friend once warned me that when a campaign appears to be going too well, somewhere there's a dragon crawling out of its lair, heading toward your candidate with bedlam on its mind. Our dragon wasn't, uh, it wasted no time in appearing. Allison may have been a polished, no, a, a political novice, but she could judge when applause had reached its peak. When she was handed a John Deere cap, she donned it, waved one last time, to the crowd and started toward the back of the stage. What happened next was a blur. There was a tangle of wire table cables on the floor. Allison did a quick check to make sure her path was clear. Then someone in the crowd called out to her and she turned toward them. 
when Allison's attention shifted, a young blonde man in a spiffy golf shirt leaned across the edge, against the edge of the stage and pushed the tangle of cables into her path. When Allison turned in the direction that would take her off stage, her foot caught in the wires and she fell forward. It was a hard fall and for a few agonizing seconds, she was motionless. Maisie handed Colin to Zach and pushed herself center stage and knelt beside Allison, murmuring her name. The man in the golf shirt pulled out his phone and started taking pictures of Allison lying face down on the stage. Jill Ajawi had her phone too, but her camera was pointed at the man and she was moving toward him. I followed close behind. When she was close enough to be heard, Jill said, delete that video and her voice was flinty. As soon as I saw the young man's face, I knew he was Clay Evanson. His lightless nightless to his mother was remarkable, but where Laurie's face radiated innocence, her son's face was dark with arrogance and anger. He had a press pass on a lanyard around his neck. He grabbed the pass and flashed it at Jill. I'm a journalist with Media Nation, he said. That's a coincidence, Jill said, pulling her photo ID out of, the, of her purse and waving it at Clay. I work for Media Nation too. Delete the, video, delete the video. Clay Evanson held his press pass closer to Jill. Read the name on this ID. Jill glanced at the name and shrugged. I heard you had a summer internship here, Clay. Those internships are a great opportunity for professionals to assess what an intern could bring to our profession. Our CEO would be very disappointed to see that video of you deliberately obstructing Alison Janvier's path so you could create a, a clip that shows her falling flat on her face. Clay was sputtering, Hugh Fairbairn is the CEO and he's also my grandfather. I could have you fired. Jill may have had a history of choosing deeply flawed men as romantic partners, but she recognized a prick when she saw one and she made short work of diminishing Clay Fairbairn. Hugh and I go way back, she said. He's a pragmatist. He would never fire a colleague for showing him <clears throat> one of his budding journalists needed a refresher course in ethics. Do yourself a favor, delete that video. Clay's peaches and cream come Complexion was mottled by anger. You really are a bitch, he said. Strike three, Jill said, and she touched her phone's keypad. Time to let Hugh see you in action. Clay's mouth twisted. Don't, he said. He touched, tapped his keypad. There, it's deleted. Now you delete yours. Jill was derisive. No way, she said. First rule of journalism, preserve the evidence. Clay reached out to grab Z at Jill's phone. Zach wheeled his chair close to Jill's side. I don't know what your game is, Mr. Fairbairn, but I'm a lawyer and you should be aware of the fact that if Alison Janvier sustained a serious injury because of that fall, you'll be up on charges. What Mrs. Jowie has on her camera is evidence of what might well turn out to be a criminal act. The law takes a dim view of people who destroy evidence. Cleo spat out the word bitch again, then stalked off. A limited vocabulary, Jill said mildly. You'll have to work on that. So that's, uh, I, I like that because it, it uh, that passage or chose, chose it partly because it's, it's good. I think, uh, you know, we have talked uh, and we will talk some more about the fact that uh, uh, mystery seemed to sp spend um, to take a very close look at the world in which um, the, their characters live, and and that often is a way for us as readers to become part of that world. So uh, that's there in in that passage, and also because it shows that uh, the conflict between innocence and evil that is part of what's uh, what uh, is explored in um, in an image at the lake. So. Thank you. Hello now. Okay. Hi. Questions? Thank you for that, Gail. That was a lovely reading. Um, so I do have a couple questions for you. 
So crime novels can be a fascinating introduction to foreign cultures. Uh, what aspects do you think crime novels offer that traditional novels or poetry cannot present? Well, I think uh, I think in part it's uh, well. I was I'm just looking around here because there's a lovely quote that I, I usually use with my students. There she is. She got oh, just I, I wrote this down because it's such a good quote. Now I can't find it. Anyway. Um, here. Oh yes, here we are, Robert Penn Warren. And most often a writer chooses a fictional world that allows them to say what they believe is the human condition. Robert Penn Warren um, wrote The Last Hurrah and he's really a wonderful writer. And that is really a, a, a very observ observant quote. He illustrates his point by saying that writers tend like all Ernest Hemingway's novels all pit man against death and you know, the they either take place in the bull ring or in a war or an old man in the sea or, uh, and always it is, uh, it, Hemingway believed that, uh, that it was only by facing his own mortality every day that a man could be a man, never a woman with Hemingway, unless they died in childbirth to show how painful it was to be a man. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but they, they, but they uh, always, it was that, just man showing that his had, had to be strong. Um, and then, uh, and then he spoke. He speaks also. Uh, Penn Warren also talked about Jane Austen's world, where it's the, you know a, a world where the truth she examines is that any well, you know, I, um, any well uh, uh, financially well off uh, man is 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 insured. A uh, uh, truth you're universally acknowledged that um, any well off man financially is in, in search of a wife. And uh, so her world is, as we know, is a beautiful cameo, very gentle and. Uh, and I mean, lots is going on in Jane Austen's world, but I think if you want to test Ben Warren's, uh, his theory, just try and imagine Ernest Hemingway sitting down at, at the, in the uh, Parsons uh, dining room, having a scone or having a Jane Austen heroine at a bullfight. And I think you can see that he's got some, uh, he has a good point there. Um, this is where I name drop Ian Rankin, who has written 20, 20 plus, Inspector John Rebus series. Um, he sets his books in Edinburgh, and I name drop him because I got to introduce him when he was he had a book in Saskatoon, and Ted and I, my husband and I, had dinner with him at and just him and his publicist, and what a nice guy. I mean, he you know, there are some writers who are not quite as nice as you might hope they are, but he was just lovely and lovely with the audience too. Um, but he says this, and it's worth quoting too. Readers realize, and why this is on why people are drawn to uh, reading crime fiction or murder fiction. Murder fiction. Readers realize that along with compelling narratives, crime fiction says important things about the state of the modern world and asks tough questions, making us think about our societies, our institutions, and ourselves. And uh, when I look at the writers that I have read with, or that you know, I've, I've been, uh, that, that you know, or just the writers that I enjoy, I see how true that observation is. Walter Mosley, and I did read with him, and he's just so great. Anyway, uh, he writes the Easy Rollins series, and and they're they're focused on Watts in California, and six days after, six decades rather after the uh, Watts riots, that place is still just devastated and what he wants it's it just filled with resentment and anger and what uh the easy in the easy rollins series what um walter mosley does is show what poverty alienation racism and uh, and uh hopelessness do to human beings and they're powerful books but they could not be i mean he chose the exact setting he needed uh louise penny and her arm on gamash series it is set in the Arcadian Beauty in Three Pines in Quebec's Eastern Townships. And Penny created a community that offers an antidote to the conviction that the world is a cruel and dangerous place. A belief that I think was sort of part of the collateral damage of 9-11. So it's, it's uh, and, and so she succeeds at, at that. Sarah Poretsky and I, she was an early, she's a friend and she was, but she was certainly an early influence on me when I started out because she writes about Chicago and it is, and she, her point is that even in a city as, as, uh, 
glittering and, and lovely and, and affluent as Chicago, there is tremendous, uh, tremendous poverty and, and, and uh, despair. I know that when I've been in Chicago, it is a very beautiful, we've been there frequently. It's a, it is a beautiful city, but often you can just turn a corner and go down the street and you're, um, you're looking at, it's a place of Dickensian horror. I mean, just the poverty and the suffering. And so it's, and, and Sarah Paretsky, that's what she wants to examine that you, uh, she wants to show that world and she wants to do something that I, I try to do in mine, in my books too. She wants to show uh, what the disparity between those who have too much and what those who have too little can do to both, both groups. Anyway, so that brings me to Joanne. And the question I get most frequently asked is, is does it limit your uh, sales of your books because they're set in Saskatchewan? And of course, I have no idea whether it does limit them or not because they're set in Saskatchewan. But, uh, but I, it, it, Saskatchewan worked for me because it said what I wanted to say. I mean, what, how I see the world. And I, I really see it as, first of all, Joanne is, is, you know, people always say, oh, are you Joanne? Well, no, but it, we have pretty much the same outlook. And that is that really we are privileged. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in a very comfortable home with my Santa Claus collection. And I want you to bring your little girl out. Someday we'll just do this together and I'll show you all of these. Uh, but, uh, and, but, you know, in, within a seven minute drive from where I'm sitting right now, People are living in absolute, um, without hope. Uh, there's child prostitution, alcoholism, drug addiction. And in all the books, Joanne and Zach and their friends who are, are made up of uh, you know, and many indigenous friends are working together to try and bring the North Central out of this cycle of poverty and hopelessness. And so, and, and, and I, because I believe and Joanne believes that you know, in, we have an obligation uh, that we, you don't just sit back and say, oh, lucky me. You have an obligation to say, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in J.S. Woodsworth's uh, really memorable phrase, you know, what we wish for ourselves, we wish for others. And that sort of is the driving principle in Joanne's life and in mine too. So I, I, I really, I'm so interested always in setting. And so but of course, it also takes you into setting, allows you to really to see an into another world. I'm now reading, uh, I'm now reading Kong Tui Bean's wonderful book about Thomas Mann. And it, it and I'm just discovering what it was like to live in Germany before, before the First World War and then in the intervening war, years and then and then the years that before Hitler, and then to be an immigrant, uh, an, you know, an emigre, to be a uh, have to leave your country. And I, I think I've always known emotionally that that must be a, a, a terrible blow. I've taught, uh, I teach a number of classes at the Open Door Society here. And all, all of the classes, all of my students, they're writing classes. And so they all write stories and they, be, they end up in a chat book. And, um, but all of them, um, but there was no, there was no uh, way they could continue to live in the country in which they live because of a variety of reasons, violence and, and uh, uh, certainly anti-Semitism anti, um, anti or, uh, or homophobia. And, and, and so they have come to Canada and they're determined to, to do, be good Canadians, but they still long, all of them would say, how that there's something that they wanted someday to go back. And one boy, uh, a man, young man wrote about, um, he came from Venezuela and he said he wanted to go and take his children someday in their grandmother's garden. And and I, I mean, I could just sort of see him and me too, you know, of course, cause I'm that person. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, so, but I mean, that's that's taken me that that book. It's called The Magician, and it's so wonderful. It's not a mystery, but it's. Uh, <clears throat> I guess it's 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 such an exploration of a very fascinating human being and a place. And you know, I know the first time we went to New Orleans, I'd read lots of, I had read plenty of books, uh, mysteries that were set in New Orleans, including uh, including um, James Lee Burke's wonderful wonderful series and. He's a best writer ever, I think. Anyway, um, 
But I mean, when we went to New Orleans, I knew everything. I already knew where I was. I knew what, what was going on. And I found that that's happened. It was the same with Chicago and same with many other cities. And, and, it's, and it's, it's a great experience because it does keep you from being absolutely parochial which I certainly would have a tendency to be living in a, uh, Regina has um, a population of about a hundred and, oh gosh, I, I, I don't know, a hundred, no, I don't know, I can't remember. It was, the population of the whole province is, is just a little over a million. So, um, and it's, it's very easy when you live in a great big, pro well, a province like ours with small population to believe that this is what life is, but uh, no, I think not. Anyway, yes. No, one of the best things about books is that it allows you to travel to all sorts of different settings, right? And settings become so important. Um, so I'm wondering, just in relation to setting, what about campus novels? Why did you choose to set several of your novels on campus? Oh, well, I, uh, I've i spent my adult life on campus. So, I mean, either I was a, you know, as a student and then as a graduate student, and then uh, I was an instructor, and then I became a professor and 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 it's um, and uh, and I that's that's all I've done. I mean, I've done that's all I've done in my professional life. I've just been always on, at a university. They are very. The reason I think I set novels there is because they're fascinating. They're they are uh, they're. It's a very rarefied atmosphere. Uh, there are so many egos. It's just uh, astounding. You know, you kind of. Uh, it really was good preparation for me to become a writer because I was kind of used to getting sharp elbows, but. Um, but it was, it, it's, it's, and of course it was lovely. To, it was great working with students. And I noticed that one of the, uh, my son just came in, um, one of the, uh, one of the papers that, um, uh, that, uh, um, that uh, Martin's student had written on was the appropriation of area and bearing Ariel, her, her life and uh, by others, appropriating her life and her, and her past and I was writing that book. And at the same time that I found myself, I was waiting for a bus and a student of mine came up and she was telling me what she wanted to do. And I said, you know, really, you are so good at English. You really should. And I thought I'm doing that very thing that I'm writing against, you know, because I mean, that's the thing that everyone, everyone, Ariel's a lovely and, and she's a beautiful and talented girl. And, young woman, and, but everyone is wanting her to be doing what they want her to do. And I was so shocked at myself that day. And I thought, you know, it's just as it is, but, uh, but there, no, there's, and I've been, you know, I was department head for seven years. So I got to see uh, that part of it. And the most fascinating, I guess, was that I was on our, the grievance committee for our union for seven years. And uh, if you academics, the things they groan about, you know, they were, I wanted so often just to say, take the boat side and say, all right, I'm going to pretend I'm your mother. The reason no one in your department likes you is because you're a jerk. Now, smarten up and everyone, it will be a lot smoother for you. So I've had all that. And then, of course, my also with my students, here's my, I, oh, he's whispering, my son just came in, such a good guy. Anyway, but um, it, and it is fascinating. There is um, it, there, physically, it's you know I think there we are. The, it was the greatest place to to work because physically universities are are usually set in very uh, very attractive places, as, and certainly ours is. And um, but also you have all kinds of spare time. I mean, it's not supposed to be spare time. It's supposed to be time to work, you know, but to do research and. Uh, but you, it's it's really lovely. But I noticed that so often, instead of doing research, uh, so many people were just chatting in the coffee rooms. And of course, then they're chatting in the coffee rooms, and then all of a sudden they they resent anyone who's actually doing work. So you see this nasty little circle going on. So there's just it's it's uh, there's there's an old axiom that the reason academic politics are so are so brutal is because the stakes are so low and it's true. I mean, like there's nothing going on. So what, I mean, I, I read, picked up a mystery once where the mystery, I started it, it was in a bookstore and uh, it was about someone murders in an English department because people wanted to be chairman of the department. 
And that would, I mean, that's beyond stupid. Nobody wants to be the chair of the department. Everybody, and you sort of, I, I got nailed into it for seven years because I was happy to have the extra time that you don't have to teach an extra class to have an extra time to write. So, but anyway, but I learned a lot in those years. So that was all to the good, but that's it. No, and I think that, but knowing students was fun too. Absolutely. Okay, so since this is a chat for the University of Marburg, can you tell me a little bit about the Marburg connection and how did you get Marburg into the story? Well, it it was, uh, it was I think it was, was a case of poor research on my part, but I, I wrote a novel called The Glass Coffin. And of course the idea for The Glass Coffin came from uh, uh, the uh, glass coth coth <laughs> coffin that um, uh, is Saint, now St. Elizabeth, uh, that Elizabeth um, uh, was uh, just, uh, you know, she wasn't buried, but she was in that. Uh, she was put in this glass coffin in the center of town. And so, the, and she, and she was the one who, who uh, uh, she, she was, uh, she, her, her sainthood came about because she had her husband had forbade her to feed the poor and she was doing this and she was walking one day with her coat and bread was in her coat holding some loaves of bread for the poor there and her husband confronted her and and she said uh, and he said you have to show me you know or whatever or you're, you're going to really be in trouble and when she opened her coat her arms were full of roses and it's 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 such an amazing story and I, I wanted to write, and, and so I, I, and the story said that that, now I know there is a St. Elizabeth's Church in Marburg, and, uh, but the, the story said that, that that coffin had been in Marburg, and that's, of course, you know, the, the Grimm's and their fairy tales, Sleeping Beauty and her glass coffin that we, you know, that we see, and, uh, but all of that just worked so perfectly with what I was doing in, in the glass coffin, which was uh, a, a, a filmmaker who uh, taped, uh, uh, filmed the suicide of his first two wives. And I mean, they were, and, and it was, I mean, one just was reckless, a, a reckless suicide, but, and the other one deliberately committed suicide because she couldn't convince him of her faith or could, to join her faith. But he, he, he uh, filmed them and then he has a 16 year old girl and he has been, uh, they have a 16 year old child and he has filmed her from the day she was born all the time. And he sees whenever he, I mean, there's never a day goes by and, and she, and he's ru ruins her life. I mean, he's, and she says, you know, well, I mean, it, it, she says, you are ruining my life. And he says, but that doesn't matter. Someday you will be old and you will still always be this beautiful in art. And it's a, it's a very, I mean, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a very dark book. And, and uh, actually it's available to German, you know, people in Marburg because it did get translated. Um, but that was it. But anyway, I, but anyway, but now I feel a very, I feel a real legitimate affin affinity with Marburg because I was invited to do this. So that worked. That's lovely. Um, so I know all your fans are dying to know what's next for the Joanne Kilburn series. Well, uh, there, there's already uh, the manuscript is finished and it's called uh, "The Past Is Prologue" and it's already. Um, I just am now when I'm finished with you. When I'm finished with you, when you're finished with me, I guess we more accurate. Um, I'm, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm doing the edit, the edits on on it from the editor in New York, and she's so good. You know, it's wonderful. I've I have learned. From every editor I've ever worked with, and uh, but uh, Emily is her name is Emily Schultz, and she is uh, she just she it, she just seems to spot the one well, not the one place but the place where there's a weakness, or and she makes a very gentle suggestion. And as soon as I listen to it uh, and listen to her her advice, uh, it the, immediately the book becomes so much better. So that's a very pleasant part of writing. I mean, people say, "Oh, I must hate it," but I don't, I, I mean, it's it's wonderful to see something that you love become better because someone's involved in it. So and that will be out in it's, what's past this prologue, that will be out in September of 2022. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Gail, for this lovely chat. And thank you to everyone in Marburg for watching this presentation. Yes, thank you all very much. Yes, I'm really glad it came together. Thank you.